here's the motherboard out of that HP Media Center computer that I was talking about in a prior video. Today the new caps came in. I ordered these from badcaps.net. So a little under $10 including shipping to, to get the seven caps I needed. And the ones I, I used are Nichicon HZ series. These are specifically rated for motherboard use and are ultra low impedance. And they're also the same physical dimension. Uh, the diameter is the most important thing to take note of when you're ordering new capacitors because when they're when they're put on there right close together like this you can't use a larger diameter capacitor in its place. These particular ones are 8 millimeter diameter. Uh, the only time the height is really important is when you're replacing caps between expansion slots then then it might become an issue. But I've even used some taller ones in, in that place before as long as there's no card that has anything that's going to hit it. It's really no big deal. But as a rule of thumb, I try to keep them the same height as the slot so that everything will clear if somebody else goes to put a different card in there in the future. So I think my soldering equipment is about as warmed up as it's going to get. I'm not looking forward to trying to melt the solder on this huge uh, copper plane on the back of the board here. Even with a, a higher wattage soldering equipment, it's, it's almost impossible to to get the solder to melt on, on setups like this where there's a, a huge slab of copper and the board is also several layers thick. I've got a couple of those on and I wanted to make a quick note on something to watch out for. Uh, those of you that have done this before know that the stripe is supposed to be the negative on a capacitor. Some boards they, they mark them wrong or do it uh, do it their own way. In this case it looks like Asus used the stripe for the positive because every capacitor on the board has its negative um, you know opposite the white stripe. I don't know if you can kind of see it on camera there but all the caps face in the same direction and the, the markings are opposite. Normally that white stripe on the circuit board would match up with the stripe on the capacitor so Definitely watch out for things like that. Well, that wasn't so bad getting the old ones off of there. It makes it a, a lot easier when you put a, a little bit of fresh solder on top of the existing solder joint to, you know, kind of make it a, a little bit bigger. It'll conduct heat easier off the iron and also flow a little better, especially if the solder on the board is lead free. All right, out with the old and in with the new wasn't too bad. It was kind of a pain to uh, get the old solder off. What I ended up having to do was carefully preheat the board with a heat gun just enough to uh, take the load off the soldering equipment. And here's a shot of the back side. I don't know how well it'll come out on camera. There's a couple stains like you can see these dark spots here and over here that's from the blue permanent marker that I used to tell myself where the electrolytics were versus the polymers. But at least the new ones are all in place now. And I just gotta hope that it's gonna work. I apologize for any uh, focus issues. I've got my camera on macro mode right now. I also removed the heat sink so I could get to those spots a little easier. Let's see. It's still hard to focus even on, on macro. There we go. 800 megahertz front side bus, 3.4 gigahertz. Not too shabby really. For, for the time period this computer was fairly top of the line. Okay before I go through all the trouble of putting all this crap back in the case I decided to do a, a quick bench test here. Just got an old old GeForce video card. It's probably like an FX 5200 or 5500 and uh, really crappy cheap power supply. Do not use these for anything other than test purposes and even then be careful with them. Auto power on. That's a good sign. EDR frequency 320 single channel or virtual single channel. Probably need to check some BIOS settings on this, but so far so good. 
Well, looky what we have here. A high pro power supply with a whole bunch of bulging TPO capacitors. I'm not all that surprised, but at the same time I'm kind of disappointed because this is a, uh, a shallow case power supply and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to fit a full size one in here. I'm going to give it a shot though. Got nothing to lose, right? The fun just never ends with these uh, shallow HP cases sometimes. I was able to fit the power supply in there, but there's two problems. The first problem being not enough room for the Molex on that top CD-ROM, I highly doubt. The bottom one looks like it might be okay. But the other problem is I found out the mounting holes are upside down from what they need to be. If I was to mount this power supply in here, like, it, like the screw holes line up, that would put the fan intake on the top of the case. That will do no good at all. So I've got the fan facing down like it should be. I'm probably just going to have to drill some new holes in the back of the case. Uh, or find a power supply that only has vents in the front. But I really would like to use one like this so it would help cool that processor. Well, as you can see, I pretty much gave up on trying to put that Silverstone power supply in there that I wanted to use. It was just too darn big. So I had to use this featherweight piece of crap uh, just temporarily until I find another low profile supply. But the one good thing about it being so cheap is I was able to bend in the uh, side panel a little bit to clear that Molex just enough so that I wasn't pinching the wires. It, it looks tighter than it actually is. But now I just got to put the motherboard back in and try to squeeze all this junk back into this case. You know it's no surprise to me that this thing overheated so badly because the ventilation is very poor. HP always used pretty pretty thick uh, metal on their cases so they were sturdy but they were not very well ventilated. Um, the design hasn't changed much from their earlier pavilion PCs that were just you know Celerons or early Pentium 3's and really they should have should have uh, improved on the cooling when they put something like this in there along with other heat producing cards like that video card and TV card that were in there. Another thing I almost forgot to mention when I had the faceplate off to uh, push the drives forward and install the power supply uh, I'll point out how HP did their stuff a little different from eMachines where they had normal optical drives behind a special faceplate. I also found that missing bezel over the card reader. It was between the uh, faceplate and the metal case. Too bad uh, the plastic snaps are broken off of it that hold it in place. Hopefully the uh, front bezel will help with that. Putting this thing together has been an absolute nightmare. Everything's crammed in there so tight. And uh, I'll tidy up the wiring later. I just want to test it first. But man, what a what an oyster can. Okay, we're ready for our first power-up test with everything in the case. I put all the original hardware back in except for the video card because it had a bad fan like you saw earlier. I'm using that same old card that I had in there for the first test. Another change I've made from the factory setup is I've taken the, the ductwork off this fan and reversed it because normally from the factory it blows in and blows down onto the CPU fan and then all the hot air from the whole computer goes through the power supply uh, which cooks the power supply. Since the CPU has its own cooling fan I reverse this to blow out like a conventional case would. Uh, it's the same ductwork like I was saying that they used in their older like P3 based systems and with those they had passive heat sinks. Uh, then I could see why they would want the fan blowing in but in this case definitely want to turn it around. But anyway, I'm going to see what happens here. Everything's all plugged in. See if it'll make it into Windows even. Static in the speakers coming from the uh, the Autogy card. I had another one of those Autogy cards doing the exact same thing. Piece of junk. 
checking file system. Yeah, this, this computer was probably very unstable last time it was used. Got to do a lot of file system checks here. Turn the volume down. This is going to take a minute. I want to stop my camera until this is through. This thing is still going. I've never seen check disks do so many things at one time. Sheesh. How did they even use this computer until it got that bad? Finally, it restarted itself. Can it go farther this time? This is uh, Windows Media Center 2004. What kind of junk is installed on this thing? Real player updater. Aim. Error killer. Oh, what do you know? I have no mouse. That always happens when I first start one of these up on the bench because uh, Windows waits until after everything else is done before it uh, installs a new driver. <laughs> oh, I'd love to click something and get out of this, but I can't. Let's try Alt F4. Oh, looks like it's either in the background or Windows hasn't caught up yet. It's taking quite a while for having one gig of RAM on Windows XP. <laughs> GeForce 4 MX 420. Wow, it's crappier than I thought. I thought it was an FX. No wonder it had a passive cooler. Mm -hmm. Alright. Here comes the mouse. Finally. There we go. Shut up. Get out of my face. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ah, Windows XP Media Center Edition, Service Pack 3, 1 gigabyte of RAM. This is the OEM Windows install. Wow, it's probably quite a mess. Probably got three different virus scanners on them, on it, and uh, none of them catch anything. Let me, uh, oh wow, look at all this stuff. This uh, computer actually belonged to an uh, ex-coworker of mine, so I'm just going to make sure they don't need anything off of it in format. I'm not going to bother browsing through it here in this video. But at least uh, hardware-wise, it appears to be up and running. And uh, might get a better power supply for it next up, if it's worth it. I might just end up finding somebody that might be able to use this system after I'm done having my fun with it. Uh, it's kind of neat. It's got AV input jacks in the front, Firewire, S-Video, USB, full card reader, dual optical drives, DVD burner, DVD ROM. Originally had a wireless keyboard. I do have the keyboard, but I don't know where the receiver is for it. Um, but it looks like uh, as soon as I get this fresh install, might at least be a usable computer again. <laughs>